welcome to Balanced Health, a show dedicated to helping baby boomers and their parents live healthier quality lives through a simple, balanced approach to health. I'm Shirley Rose and this is Joe Costello, our resident health activist. With more and more baby boomers having children later in life and with some like myself who have lots of grandchildren already, it's important that we all stay up to date on the health issues and pediatric medical advancements that may affect the ones we love. So joining us today is Dr. Katherine Sunderbrook, a board certified pediatrician from Dreyer Medical Clinic to talk about some issues that are plaguing children today. Welcome, Dr. Hi, Sunderbrook. Hi, nice to meet you, thank you. And I'm a little rusty. You know, it's been a while <laughs> since I raised my kids, but now I have, I have 10 grandchildren, so I really need to listen to what you have to say today. So, well, well congratulations. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, and we are seeing some, some problems with children today, and one of the things that, of course, we, well, before we get to that, I know Joe has some news for us, but we're gonna be talking about uh, some of the diseases that are plaguing children that really are, are like, this is unknown uh, until just recent years. So what is your nutrition in the news today, buddy? Surely, Dr. Sunderbrook, today's nutrition in the news deals with the overuse of antibiotics. Recently, the American Academy of Pediatrics has changed a long time stand on the use of antibiotics for many ear infections. Ear infections are something I am very familiar well, with with my, my kids. Well, my kids had one after the other oh. when they were growing up. They're citing that the overuse is resulting in antibiotic resistance. So, questioning, and also questioning the efficacy as well. They are still recommending antibiotics for sinus infections. So, mm -hmm. Dr. Sunderbrook, in your practice, what are we seeing out there? What do you do when you see that? Do you, do you whip out the prescription pad? Do you get the pink medicine? What do, you, what do you do for ear infections? Well, you're absolutely right. The old school philosophy was as soon as you saw an ear infection or even an ear that you thought might become infected, mm -hmm. you went ahead and gave antibiotics right away. And what we are finding out is that not only is it killing off the uh, bacteria that are causing the infection, but it's leaving a few bacteria behind after the therapy is done. Mm. And those bacteria are sort of evolving, so to speak, and becoming smarter and able to ward off the killing effect of the antibiotics. Super germs. That, yeah, I mean, once you, if you've exposed to it enough and enough kids get together and share their germs with one another, which they always do, um, those germs are then m more prone to be resistant next time you need to give an antibiotic. Mm. With sinus infections, the protocol is still to use an antibiotic, correct? It's still to use an antibiotic, but to be conservative with your use and really think about what are the chances that this is a true bacterial sinus infection and what are the chances that it's going to get better with no therapy at all? Well, my husband, I just so happened, my husband was very sick uh, this, for about the last week and he just wasn't getting any better. And it started with allergies, and I think sinus infections often start with allergies, and this is the season of the year, and he just kept getting sicker and sicker. He never really ran a high fever or anything, but he had like a little low-grade fever a couple of days, and when he finally did go to the doctor, he immediately put him on anti antibiotics because it was a sinus mm -hmm. infection, and I sure was thankful that he did. <laughs> oh, and certainly antibiotics can be, you know, not only life-saving, but can certainly spare both children and adults from missing school, missing work, sure. mi missing out on, you know, all the activities that we all want to be a part of on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, my kids had one inf ear infection after another, as I said, and I mean, that little pink bottle was like my, yeah. you know, I loved it, and and, and I would have hated, hated to think, you know, and, and I have to, can I just throw in a, a viewer question sure, real quick? Please. You know, the viewer says, you know, my kids are sick, you know, what do I do? I mean, I want them to feel better. Why can't I give them antibiotics, and what do I do? Right, well, the, you know, the first thing that we try to do as pediatricians is to really empower the families because there are a lot of things that you can do that don't have anything to do with antibiotics or chemicals or really anything at all you know outside of what parents can provide at home um, you know a lot of times ear infections sinus infections start with allergies or nasal congestion from a viral infection hmm. so you can do all kinds of things to help control that like you know, blowing the nose well, or in young children, sucking the mucus out of their mm -hmm. nose, sure. using humidifier or warm steam to help open up the nasal passages. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously staying hydrated is very important, um, especially when kids are sick. Well, you know, Shirley, in our own family, my oldest daughter had one ear infection after another. And then my second daughter was the same thing. When it really got overboard is when we had a puppy and a puppy got an ear infection, and I came home, and I opened the refrigerator door, and there were three bottles of pink medicine in there. One was for the puppy. One was for the, that's when I knew that there was. But uh, we have an old-fashioned European pediatrician, kind of a doctor, and he said, they didn't test positive to be allergic to milk or dairy, but I want you to take them off of cow's milk. Hmm. 
He said, because what happens is that stuff just coagulates and it just further compounds the problem. Well, I can only speak from, you know, empirically, so to speak, from my own family. When we stopped our kids, when we took our kids off of cow's milk, um, it just made a dramatic difference wow. in the amount of ear infections that they got. In fact, my two, my little guys, my boys had, I could count them on one hand how many ear infections they had. Mm. And we just did not give them cow's milk until they were like seven or eight years old. So do you see, is that something you recommend in your practice? Have you seen any... Um, not uh, usually as a first-line therapy, but parents know their kids better than anybody else. And if a parent mm -hmm. is telling me, you know, I really think that this might be contributing to my child's illness, you know, and I don't think that it's going to be harmful to them, then, you know, we go ahead and, you know, keep an open mind and try just about anything, you know, to avoid the cycle of, you know, infection, antibiotic, reinfection, more antibiotics. Sure. Um, and really trying to keep kids healthy for as long as we can. Well, this whole idea of the super germ and, and germs becoming resistant to antibiotics, you know, they used to tell us take every drop of that bottle, you know, for even though it's a week after you start to feel better. Take, are they kind of changing that now? Does that help not to take so much after you start feeling better? Well, you certainly um, only want to treat people for the duration that they need to treat the infection. But certainly if your physician gives you an antibiotic with a recommended you know, time to take it, you really want to make sure okay. to take the whole amount. Because what happens is if you don't and you only partially treat the infection, not only can the infection come back sooner, but it leaves some of that bacteria behind that's already tasted the antibiotic and they're more likely to become resistant later oh, on. So that, so not taking it all actually helps that germ to survive exactly. and get strong. Wow, interesting. What else are you seeing in, uh, in your practice um, that might be different than pediatricians were seeing years ago. You know, the onset and prevalence of, I mean, I have a couple of things, I'll just ask this one directly, o obesity, childhood obesity. I mean, it used to be, you know, that that was more of an anomaly than a real medical problem. Do you see it as a medical problem? I see it every single day in my practice. I see kids who uh, fall on the spectrum of overweight all the way into obese. Mm. Um, and some kids are, you know, only mildly overweight where it's something we just need to watch all the way to high blood pressure, heart disease, and type two diabetes, you know, even before what? the teenage years. Well, so you have actually seen children be diagnosed with type two, which is not childhood mm -hmm. onset. Uh, before their teens. Oh, certainly. Wow. Let me put That's you on the spot really here, sad. Dr. Sunderbrook. How, and this must be difficult, but at some point in time, it would seem to me that the pediatrician has to say to the parent, look, you have to say no. I mean, I understand that, you know, you're not trying to put your child, you know, in a bad light, but there's a point in time where you have to say, you're going to get this portion and that's it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we, you know, we obviously need to do that, you know, and do that on a pretty regular basis. Um, you know, some things that I find helpful are to show them their growth over time and how fast their child is gaining weight compared to how fast they're gaining height. And a lot of times that that sort of visually shows to them how out uh -huh. of balance yeah. things are with their kids. Uh -huh. well, uh -huh yeah, moment. Yeah, we're going to mm -hmm. talk more about that. But for more information on today's nutrition in the news, check out TLN.com, click on Balanced Health. And up next, in the old days, people used to say it was healthy for a child to have some meat on their bones. But does the husky factor still ring true today? We'll find out after the break. We'll be right back.